Welcome to episode two of Truth and Consequences with Doug Papa. I want to take a minute to thank all of you for the supportive comments on the premiere episode of my podcast that dealt with the unsolved 2016 Las Vegas Land Kaufman double homicide. Part two of that series will be forthcoming soon. Many of you have asked why I call my podcast Truth and Consequences. In future episodes, I will answer that question. Right now, Legendary NYP detective Frank Serpico, now retired, is a man who truly faced truth and consequences during his police career. Frank Serpico was the first police officer in American history to come forward and expose widespread corruption in a police department. In 1971, during an undercover narcotics operation in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn, Frank was shot in the face as his two partners failed to assist him in making entry into a drug dealer's apartment. Frank is a recipient of the NYPD's highest award for bravery, the Medal of Honor. In 1972, Frank Serpico testified at the Knapp Commission that was investigating the extent and nature of police corruption within the New York City Police Department. His testimony riveted the room. Here is an excerpt from Frank's testimony before the Knapp Commission. Uh, he informed me about uh, the pad. Now, the pad, what, uh, what is a pad? Uh, How do you define it? A uh, pad is um, a systemized um, pickup of monies from gamblers uh, in order to um, uh, give them immunity from arrest. We must create an atmosphere in which the dishonest officer fears the honest one and not the other way around. I hope that this investigation and any future ones will deal with corruption at all levels within the department and not limit themselves to cases involving individual patrolmen. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, Thursday, May 28th, 2020. It's about 1.30 in the afternoon Pacific time, and I'm on the phone with uh, legendary NYPD detective, retired Frank Serpico. Uh, how you doing today, Frank? Uh, not bad, Doug. How about yourself? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, just looking at these uh, sad set of circumstances been going on the past two days. We had the uh, death of George Floyd by the hands of the police officer who had his uh, knee on the man's neck as the crowd was telling him to let go, which spurred uh, some riots over in Minneapolis. And I guess last night, according to the news, uh, during the riots, uh, a man was shot and killed, uh, allegedly, supposedly, from what the news broadcast, by possibly a store owner. Um, you've seen a lot in your uh, days as a police officer, and I know you're an advocate for civil rights, human rights. Um, what's your take on all this stuff, Frank? Well, first, uh, I think uh, for your listeners, we have to lay a little um, groundwork uh, about um, the illusion and the reality. Uh, now, I'm not afraid to speak what I'm saying because good cops will support me, and those that find a problem with what I'm saying are the very ones that are causing the problem. And the background I want to lay is that when I was a patrolman uh, in my early days, when we got out of the academy, uh, we're very anxious to see where we're assigned. You get two kinds of assignments. One was uh, called a, um, a, one is a social club that like if you got um, assigned to certain areas in Queens or something or Staten Island, they would say, that's a social club. Uh, no crime going on there, right? Uh, um, uh, except, you know, the traffic, some minor things. And the other ones, um, I'll correct myself later, I'm not getting the right uh, word, uh, action precinct. That's what it was, an action precinct. Now, an action precinct um, is the equivalent of being in the military and being in the combat zone. And um, in the um, uh, social clubs, it's like, yeah, you're in the military during the war, but you never saw any combat. So I hear a lot of cops saying, ah, oh, this toughest job. Yeah, for some guys, those that are in the combat zone, but the other guys, 
they're getting a free ride uh, because people are thinking, oh, that's terribly dangerous. Now, in little communities, um, cops probably never even saw a crime committed, uh, or if they did, uh, didn't know how to handle it. And vis-a-vis uh, up north, uh, an example is uh, somebody called the police because they saw uh, a burglary in progress in a in a, a saloon, and and uh, the cops go in the front door <clears throat> instead of you know uh, one going in the front and the other coming in the the back, and the guy went out the back door. Goodbye. Okay, so part of it is having some smarts. Now the other thing is, as I was saying, when I was a young cop, I was in an action precinct and i loved it like good cops will say you know that you get the rush the adrenaline right uh but it's it's not beating up people it's the challenge of catching you know somebody uh doing the wrong thing and um or helping people uh who are in need and keeping them out of danger right so one night my phone rings and it's uh, this girl uh, or young lady that I was dating. Uh, she was on my post. I had a regular uh, post uh, in Bedford Stuyvesant. It was post 36. And her house was next door to a, uh, a garage, right? And the windows looked right into uh, the uh, garage, the back window. Uh, in particular, her bedroom window. And she was living with her mother and father. And uh, she calls me up one night and she says, Frank, Frank, you, you got to do something. Uh, there's a burglary next door in in the garage. And I said, w- what are you calling me for? Call the cops. She says, Frank, it is the cops. And cops in their uh, radio cars were jamming tires into their trunks wow. so what am i going to do call the precinct or like she said i would call the precinct so um i knew this one inspector that i had the fortune to meet because i went to college uh, studied police science before i became a cop and there were a lot of cops in my class and this one inspector uh, i had befriended or he befriended me i called him up And he investigated and he found the cops, uh, you know. So if they knew that it was another cop that did it, uh, I don't put it past them that they would take me out. Right. And why? Because across the street from my friend's house was a bodega. And he also saw what was going on. And he also called the police to no avail, of course. Well, A couple of days later, he was uh, due to go to his mother's house for a visit. So instead of going home the usual way and taking the parkway, he took this uh, side road, and he's on Broadway, and he's stopping for a light. He's going slow. His brake goes to the floor, and he's totally out of control, except that he wasn't going fast and slows down, and he ends up hitting the um, uh, the subway stanchion, uh, uh, whatever you call it, that's supporting the overhead. And, you know, he wrecked his car. So I went down. Now, mind you, I'm a patrolman, but I have a degree, you know, in police science right. and uh, forensics. And uh, so I go down and I get his brake linings. And I can see they're cut. So I bring them to the lab and I say to the guy, uh, I want uh, a report on these. Uh, You know, what caused this? Uh, Was it uh, wear due to natural causes? And he said, anybody could see they were cut. So I didn't see it. I don't know. But the facts or the suspicion points to the guys in the precinct. Uh, and I wouldn't put him past it. Now, the other one was when I was involved with the NAP Commission, and, you know, the NAP Commission came about because I reported 
widespread corruption in the New York City Police Department. Right. This wasn't penny ante stuff. This was million dollar stuff in narcotics and gambling and prostitution. All over the city it was going on. And now the Knapp Commission investigators, they were out one night in my neighborhood uh, where I lived. There was a meat market. And I was out walking the dog, and there it is, a burglary in progress by um, green and black uh, cops' cars stuffing sides of beef into their cars. Wow. So now it wasn't only me, it was the Knapp Commission people that saw it. And that was one of the things that gave some substance to the uh, Knapp Commission going further and, and not being lapsed out. So this is what civilians uh, are not aware of. And then you say, well, that was back in the 60s, the 70s. No, let's talk about now. I have a New York State trooper on video uh, where a builder destroyed my property, and is, it is still being destroyed now because no one will do anything about it. And um, the, the builder said, I said, I want this man arrested. The cop said, what for? I said, what for? Look at this. He says, well, when did this, I, I said, what? You don't see what he did? And the guy said, you, you, you want me arrested? You, you, want to, you want to do this to me? I said, look what you did to my property. On video, he says, officer, you want to take another walk around the property, just you and me? Hey, uh, you don't have to be an experienced law enforcement officer to know what's going on here. Right. And on camera, the, I don't even want to call him a trooper. He's a lowlife wearing a trooper's uniform, a New York State trooper. And um, he starts picking on me. He says, you trespass on this man's property, you're going to be arrested. Wow. I said, what? Me trespass? You know, and so what I'm saying is this is where we are today that in the old days, when cops would, and I must say, sometimes if you're doing good police work, sometimes you screw up and innocent people get hurt. Right. Now, you shouldn't have to lie about that. Uh, but what happens, cops in my day, uh, they would either, you know, drop a gun on them or a knife uh, or if uh, even narcotics when, you know, it's called flaking somebody uh, to, uh, you know, it could be, a, a, and I, I saw this and I said, what the hell are you doing? Ah, that guy's a piece of shit. It, it was some kid who I took the needle out of his arm because he was ODing and the so-called informant gave this user up because the cops gave him a break and then the cops put the drugs on the user and say he's a dealer. Right. So, um, meanwhile, everybody knows, uh, you know, Dowd, Robert, Lucy. Uh, uh, I knew Lucy personally. I didn't know Dowd, but Dowd spoke for himself in the film The Seven Five, which I thought was a great expose into how low criminality can go uh, by men in police uniforms. Right. And I always said there's no such thing as a crooked cop. You're either a criminal wearing a cop's uniform because you're too much of a coward to go out and rob as an individual. You're hiding behind a shield and a gun. And you could use it. The problem is the laws today, when they were made, they believed in justice. They believed that the police were beyond reproach because the police were there to uphold the law, not abuse the law. But uh, this is not the way it is in reality. So I don't want to hear cops saying, 
oh, you're always talking about the, you know, the bad stuff. You never talk about the good stuff. Yeah, there are some wonderful cops out there. And the interesting thing is that it must be part of human nature because not only cops, but civilians, myself included, I jumped into a canal to save a drowning girl. I wasn't a cop. I was retired. I was living in another country. I didn't have to put my life in, in jeopardy because I wasn't, you know, a Olympic swimmer. But there's something about human nature when you see one of your species in trouble or even sometimes an animal, you respond because that is what sets the human apart from the beast. Absolutely. So either we are human beings or we are beasts, and we have to come to that uh, reality. So what I'm saying is there are many people who have jumped and um, uh, um, rescued people, sometimes at the cost of their own life because they died in the process. So... Cops that have, uh, you know, well, I was going to say cops that have uniforms. Uh, you know, sometimes even a cop who will think nothing of, you know, doing some graft will respond when another human being is in trouble. So we have some psychological stuff going on here, and I'm not a psychiatrist. I leave that to the experts. So it is our nature to respond and help. And on that note, when we as people see a man in a uniform committing a crime such as murdering an innocent people, then it behooves us to take action. But how the hell are you going to take action when the man committing the crime is wearing a police uniform has a shield, a gun, and a taser, and no doubt, and you you see it all over the the networks today where cops get back, get back, and they start threatening the people who are trying to intercede in an unlawful arrest. Right. So this is what has to be corrected. Uh, but again, the bad cops, they start making excuses. It's again, in my day and even today, it hasn't changed. Somebody, uh, oh, I, I just put it on Twitter. This beautiful soul, I called him. He was on um, this uh, program, a talent show. He did 37 years for somebody else's crime. And the man held on to his dignity. He said, they locked up my body, but not my mind. Right. And he, he sang, and he put on this beautiful performance. So uh, the thing is that um, what happens is, you know, especially if there's a white victim involved, and they assume that the defendant is black, and as this man said, well, I was black, I was young, I had no money, I became the victim. So some cops, uh, I want to say some, uh, when they make up their mind uh, to solve a case in a hurry, instead of getting off their ass and doing a proper investigation, they'll pick some poor guy who has you know, no way of defending himself and throw the book at him instead of finding exculpatory evidence they find everything to say that he's guilty and as a result you have innocent people sitting uh wasting their lives away in prison uh again for those that are going to say are you kidding good show? not all of them yeah some people are there that committed heinous crimes i'm talking about the innocent ones that were put in jail by lazy ass corrupt cops that didn't do the footwork. And, um, and at this point I might bring up Mike Bell, a friend of mine who cops murdered his son 
and, and this man uh, was um, uh, a lieutenant colonel who fought in three wars, comes home to find his blue-eyed blonde kid. It's not always a thing of color, and it's not police corruption. It's a culture, a rotten, corrupt police culture. And they shot his son point blank in the head in front of his mother and sister. And Mike Bell is still trying to get justice for his murdered son today. But it's not forthcoming because cops will not investigate themselves. And if they claim they do, they get some committee where they're retired cops or some way related to uh, the uh, legal system. So uh, getting back to the this incident where you have this low life, and I can only say in my opinion, it, it is, uh, if you're white and you have a black man with his hands cuffed behind his back who is totally helpless and there are three other cops present watching and you keep your knee on his neck until the man expires and then you have the audacity to say, oh, well, we were investigating and it seemed that the man had a medical problem. Oh, really? A medical problem? Yeah, you would have a medical problem too if somebody had their knee on your neck uh, with your face into the, in, into the concrete and the police stand there and do nothing. Right. That and was... the human beings that were watching and said, what are you doing? The man is helpless. He can't breathe. How are they going to stop him when these men are wearing a uniform alleging to be there to protect and serve the public? That's it a, is insane behavior. That's a dilemma, Frank. Now, oh, I'm going to interrupt for a second, but I want to expound on that. You have, um, we watched the video. I thought it was one of the most horrendous videos I've ever watched. I was actually in tears watching that the other day. Um, you have a group of people who are calling out the officer saying he can't breathe, his nose is bleeding, you're killing him. They're calling names at the officer. Um, the, the dilemma here is this. A group of citizens are observing a police officer with other police officers there. In essence, the police officers are aiding in the death of this person, and it's obvious in that video. What is the people watching to do? What would have happened if one, two, or three of those citizens would have jumped on the police officer to save that man's life? Um, possibly they could have been shot. Uh, they uh, seriously hurt, but it, but I tell you what would have happened because this is the law that has to be corrected. They would have been charged with the murder that the police officer committed. They would have been charged with um, what is the uh, the victim's name? Um, George Floyd. Uh, Floyd, because this is what happens in our convoluted legal system. There was an incident a while back in the New York City Police Department, uh, several of them, um, where incompetent police officers shot and killed members of their own department. Okay? One of them was in a housing where an officer was struggling uh, with a suspect. And he says on the phone, he's going for it, which might sound like he's going for his gun or something. And his fellow officers open fire, killing the officer. Now they claim, I say claim, because from my experience, um, uh, the problem, I might as well say it now, is that the police have lost all credibility 
in the eyes of the public. And sorry to say, it's their own fault through what we are talking about today and all the videos that we are seeing uh, happening in our current time. Now, um, the, uh, they claim that the um, guy the officer was struggling with uh, had a gun, but it wasn't fired. So it stands clear that the police killed one of their own. Now, the suspect gets charged with murder uh, or manslaughter because in, in the uh, commission of a crime, a person was killed. That's right. how the law reads. And correct me, somebody, if it's otherwise. The other one was um, there was this wacko kid. Yeah, he was a uh, he he, uh, he he was to, uh, he actually was performing a service to the police because he would break into the uh, into the police station in broad daylight with a towel around his neck uh, like Superman and say, "Ta-da! I'm here to help you." Oh, get the hell out of here. Okay. So in this particular incident, um, uh, there a call came in that there was a robbery in progress of a uh, cell phone place. Um, and um, so two detectives, unfortunately, uh, weren't wearing their bulletproof vest like they were supposed to. Uh, they were on a special detail, and they responded. Now, something I do not understand, because they claim that they went into the store and the suspect came out holding a gun. Now, uh, it turned out, I'm not going to say it until after, anybody pointing a gun at me in the commission of the crime is going down. Right. But for some reason, they did not fire, and they backed out of the store. That has never been explained. Now, police responding to the scene opened fire, and I forget how many rounds were fired, 40, 50 rounds, ending up in this blaze of fire that an honorable police officer lost his life and another one got shot in the leg by the cops now, by the cops or by the assailant well that's a good question because i'll let your people answer that because the assailant had a toy gun wow. so they toy gun i don't care if it looks real you're going down right but a toy gun doesn't shoot right so what happened, uh, this uh, psycho uh, stick-up guy gets charged with murder because in a commission of a crime, someone gets killed, the person committing the crime gets charged with, and again, either murder or manslaughter, whatever the technicality is. Right. And that's about, it. That's about every state in the country. Why doesn't this apply to someone when he commits a crime and is wearing a police uniform with a police shield and the authority to take your life in the blink of an eye? Something has to change. I always say... If uh, you are in the performance of your duty and you find yourself in danger, by all means, fire away and take them down. Uh, in my time, I've, I don't know why, I, you know, uh, armed robbery, exchange of fire, um, you know, yeah, one man in a in a bar and grill, um, but you know what I think it is. What's that, Frank? I think it's the weapon, uh, and I am guilty because I am the first 
police I'm losing your... Hang on a second, Frank. Say that again. I just lost you there for a second. Okay, I'm saying that I'm, I'm half guilty. I'll explain. In 1967, when I encountered overwhelming corruption and found my life in danger, uh, not only from the criminals, but the police officers I was working with. So I went out and I bought myself a Browning 9 millimeter with a 14 round magazine. And I remember the storekeeper saying, you're expecting an army and just a division. So, um, it took the New York City... Frank, hold on a second. Hang on a second. Um, it's getting distorted. Um, try talking a little further back from the phone. I don't know if it's uh, if it's your end or my end, but I lost you on that important part. I want you to say that again about the Browning. Uh, okay. Back in the 60s, uh, when my life was in danger because I was in a combat zone in, in the Bronx uh, where I was working, um, and... Um, I found myself not only in, that's my rooster in the background might be interrupting. No, uh, it's fine. I hear, uh, I hear you. Go ahead. Might be, uh, my life was in danger from the criminal element as well as some of the police officers I was working with. So I went out and I bought myself a Browning 9 millimeter automatic 14 round clip for my personal protection and the uh, the uh, gun uh, clerk said you're expecting an army and I said no just a division because I was working in the 7th division at the time it took the New York City Police Department 25 years to catch up because we all had 38 special, right. which was uh, a lead, uh, not jacketed uh, slug. My partner shot a guy once through the windshield and of his car, and it went through the windshield, hit the guy in the chest, and fell on his lap. So that's how effective there was. It worked both ways, too, because a police officer was also shot in the head, and the 38 just hit him in the forehead and embedded in his in his forehead fortunately Jesus. and uh, didn't do uh, further damage so what I'm saying is that with the inception of the automatic weapons to the police these are the when they slaughtered Amadou Diallo with 41 rounds um, and then the mayor came up with the excuse, oh, that's because um, they were uh, full jacket. I went right through them and didn't take them down. Uh, oh, maybe we should go to, uh, you know, hollow points or whatever. It's not the ammunition. It's how many times you hit the guy. Again, going back, there were times when I was off duty in the very beginning and all I had was a Smith and Weston snub nose five round cylinder with no extra rounds. And I caught myself, uh, fortunately, uh, they didn't return fire at me, but they had just uh, been in a murder uh, in a shootout and I chased him on my motorcycle. And uh, I chased him, and the car came to a double park, and what I realized at the end was they were just going to drop the weapons off in this lot. And But I didn't know what was going on. The guy had a gun in each hand. And, yeah, call me stupid what you want. I don't care. I'm here to talk about it. 
and I took cover. First thing you learn, you take cover behind the trunk of a car, and I had surmised they were Spanish. And I said, Policia, levante la mano, no te mueve. And um, the guy stood there, and I fired a warning shot. At that time, you could fire a warning shot. That left me four rounds. Fortunately, on hearing the shot, the car took off, and the guy with the guns also took off, but on foot, and I glommed him. I took three guns off him and pockets full of ammo. Now, I don't know. I can only speak for myself. Today, uh, there are some cops, instead of firing one round or tap, tap, and uh, observe, as uh, with Amadou Diallo, they fucking, uh, excuse me, but I get uh, bleep that. I, I get too emotionally involved in the stupidity of bad police work resulting in the loss of innocent life. Right. Amadou Diallo was not a criminal. He was standing in his doorway getting a breath of air. So you might say he was breathing while black. Frank, hold now, that thought for a second. Frank, hold that thought. I want, uh, for the listeners, I'm online with retired New York City Police Department detective Frank Serpico. For those who uh, were not alive then, who don't know, um, Frank Serpico was the first police officer in American history to expose widespread police corruption in a police department. And um, he was later uh, shot in the head uh, during an undercover drug operation. And he's been long since retired from the police department. Okay, Frank, go ahead. Just want to put that in there so people know who I'm talking to. Go ahead. Uh, well, at that point, I might uh, add that my backup never called for officer down or a 1013, and they let me there uh, to bleed to death. And as later, uh, one cop, I won't mention his book because I have no respect for him or what he writes. Uh, he, he did get arrested for shaking down a drug dealer, but he beat the case, and, uh, and then uh, later he made himself out to be a whistleblower, uh, saying that um, they, uh, he was arrested because uh, he complained about some uh, uh, a lieutenant or something uh, having to do with a traffic violation getting, I don't know, convoluted. But he knew the guy that responded. One police car responded with two cops in it. There was no 1013 officer down. One cop's car responded. And all for years I said, well, at least I know there were two cops that picked me up and took me to the hospital. By the way, my backup team was there. They could have brought me to the hospital in, in their car too, but they didn't do that. And then later I found out from this guy's book that he, his partner said, Turn here onto Driggs Avenue. See that building? That's where Serpico got shot. I was one of the officers that responded. If I knew it was Serpico, I would have left him there to bleed to death. Jesus. So if you want to ask questions why these uh, quote-unquote good cops don't intercede with the bad cops, that's the reason why. Frank, because hold on. you have this. Hold that thought for a second. I want to read something here. It's from the Knapp Commission report, which was the commission that started after you came out and exposed the corruption. Uh, they say something here. This is exactly from the Knapp Commission report. I'm, I'm going to read it. Um, they're talking about whether all cops are corrupt to some extent and all not. And, of course, they say this in the report. This is, quote, of course, not all policemen are corrupt. If we are to exclude such petty infractions as free meals— an appreciable number do not engage in any corrupt activities. This is important here. Yet, with extremely rare exceptions, even those who themselves engage in no corrupt activities are involved in corruption in the sense 
that they take no steps to prevent what they know or suspect to be going on about them. That statement is so true 50 years ago, and it's so true today in police work, Frank. Well, um, you know, uh, yeah. And the, another, another the, thing, the I, hate, I hate to interrupt, I hate to interrupt, Frank, but you said something when we were talking about the day you were shot, and you used the word your backup team. Um, maybe yeah. we should use that word lightly because they did not back you up. Yeah, well, they uh, they pretend uh, backup team or uh, whatever, but you know, it, it's look, uh, Doug, it's not only them. It's I, you know, <clears throat> okay. I would like to straighten something out. There's a, a a cop out there who's a Harvard graduate, right? He became a cop, and he wrote a book, and uh, it was a bestseller, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you have used the word a lot, POS, right? Right. Now, this guy, um, he's a Harvard graduate. In my opinion, in my opinion, he is a POS. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Because he uses his Harvard degree to gain credibility from the public and write a book. Now, if you want to write a book, that's fine. But when you take shots at Serpico, and I'm not saying I'm Serpico, Serpico is an element that stood for something. Right. When you take shots at Serpico, then you're as low, in my opinion, as the bad cops that Serpico turned in. Mm -hmm. And this is why I say this. First of all, his grandfather was the bag man for the commissioner. And he says so in his books. But he finds that to be an amusing novelty, you see. Mm -hmm. They got very fancy words, these Harvard guys. And um, he says there was no corruption. It was corrosion. And you know what? Serpico was half crazy before he got shot in the head. Now, this is a Harvard graduate, you see, writing a bestseller book. And then in the movie Serpico, as some people may remember, uh, I arrested uh, a member of, well, I was going to say gang, but I don't know if it was a gang. There was, but there were uh, uh, three or four of them. Uh, that were abducted a black woman and raped her and sodomized her. Mm -hmm. Okay, And I responded, they were in a schoolyard. And um, fortunately, uh, I was able, I, I never used my gun. I, I could have shot them. And, uh, you know, I, I fired at other fleeing felons at time. But for some reason, I don't know, I just, I... I outran the guy. I glommed him. I don't know what the hell my partner was doing <laughs> because, uh, oh, he didn't even want to respond. He was saying, well, you know, it's uh, you know, those, uh, you know, and I, I want to say the word. I don't want to do this N word. Uh, I think that's the problem. Everybody's saying the N word now, the N word. No, they call them niggas because they try to demean another human being. Right. And with this N-word, it is made light of the fact of how they demean another human being. Right. And so, oh, it's just one of those niggas. And so I, I didn't even respond to what he said. I was driving, so I drove into the uh, schoolyard. I apprehended one. So now, uh, Blackjack was the detective's name. They beat the crap out of this guy. Who are your playmates, right? And he wouldn't talk. The guy came out, he was bloodied, right? Mm -hmm. So the next morning, uh, when I was taking him uh, to be uh, arraigned, I said to the paddy wagon guy, uh, hey, um, I'm going to take him down in my own car, you know? I was off duty, but I had to arraign him. Mm -hmm. So I take the guy around the corner, and 
I say to him, I'm taking the handcuffs off you. You try to run, I'll put one right in your back. Do you understand me? He said, yeah, yeah, man. He says, how come you didn't, uh, how come you didn't take part in the, in the fun? You know, I said, that's not my idea of fun. So I took him around the corner to a cafeteria and I got him a cup of coffee. Now what I'm doing is what you call good police work if you want to do it. So, um, you know, I schmoozed the guy. I didn't lie to him. I let him enjoy his coffee. I drove him to the uh, courthouse to be arraigned. And just before I took him in, I stopped the car. And I said, you know what? I really got to hand it to you. I said, yeah, I don't like what you did last night. I said, but you're taking the fall for these guys. You know what that means? He said, what? I said, what? I said, you're lucky if you'll ever see the light of day again. I said, kidnapping, weapon, sodomy, rape. I said, you're going away, man. He said, well, I didn't even, I said, well, I didn't say you did, but you were the guy I caught. I said, I tell you what, uh, and I schmoozed him a little. I got the names of his three playmates. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, by the way, I never got a medal or citation for any of this. And so, uh, getting back to our Harvard graduate, he writes, <laughs> yeah, Sergeant buys him a cup of coffee. I see coffee in the face and uh, a get well card from Florida or something like that. And I want to say to this guy, you POS, you know, trying to belittle my police work, but it doesn't stop there. Because uh, when I heard what he said in, in his article uh, that he uh, called police corruption corrosion, I called up the reporter and I said, oh, is that the Harvard word for corruption? Right. So sound bite, the reporter writes, yeah, Serpico respond, blah, blah, blah. Now, one of his crony friends one of his ass kissing friends or whoever was kissing whoever's ass, a New York City police captain writes in to the newspaper and says, now get this, he's proud of what he's gonna say or what he said. I am a New York City police captain. I've been on the force for 25 years, I worked in all five boroughs. Now, here's the kicker. I never saw the corruption Serpico alleges. He ought to be ashamed of himself. Jesus you Christ. see, I should be ashamed of myself for exposing him and not him for having his head all the way up the back of his colon. Right. And this is what the culture is. They kiss each other's asses and they come on big like this Harvard guy. He's doing did pretty well for himself in the NYPD. Uh, you know, he became, I believe, the commissioner's fair haired boy. And um, and that's the way it works. The system is rotten and it will never be corrected because as I said in my testimony at the NAP commission, the honest cop fears the crooked cop and not the other way around. That's so and when true. that changes, things will change. Well, Frank, you so can't, uh, on that, I'm going to, um, you know, 
take a break for now and we can take it up another time. Um, but as we could see, the, um, the system hasn't changed. Uh, the only difference is now it's being caught on film and, um, there are cases and cases, you know, uh, where this happens and the, the police union will stand up for you. Uh, they'll get you good lawyers. And in fact, here's a, another little tidbit. Uh, when the, the cops I was working with knew I wasn't taking any money and got a little suspicious, they said, Frank, listen, don't worry if you ever get in trouble. If you ever get in trouble, we drop 50 grand in your hand and we got lawyers to take care of you. Jeez. That's how the system works. The union endorses it. And um, that's what has to, that we have to realize that the police have to be held responsible when they commit a crime, just like any other person commits the same crime. You don't cut them any flack, unless it was done in the lawful pursuit of their duty. Then we have to back up our offices 100%. But when they do it, in the legal and lawful pursuit of their duty, not when they're lynching a black man in public. And as I said on Twitter, whether you use your knee or a rope, it's still a lynching. And I am a white man, and I have been amazed at the control that people of color have used if I was black, I'd be in jail today because I knew that I might be next. And for what? For breathing while black. And it's not only black people. It's people of color, the disenfranchised. I've gotten beat up myself while working on the cover because cops, they could do it and get away with it. And who was I? Just a skull. But in my pocket, I had a badge that said New York City Police Department. And I'm thinking, if you do this to one of your own who's doing his duty, what are you doing to innocent people who have no recourse at all? And on that note, I'm going to say um, thanks for listening and thanks for asking me your questions and uh, again we have to it's not us that has to yeah we have to support the good officers but the system the captains and the lieutenants and the chiefs and the judges and the district attorneys they have to support the police officers when they come out and expose corruption but they don't do it because I hear from cops all over the country and the world. And the mantra is always the same. The people in authority that they complain to tell them we can't expose this corruption because it'll undermine the public's uh, credibility in the police and we can't do that. Well, maybe you might have that credibility in the wealthy communities of black and white people, but not in the people that are being victimized because they have already lost confidence and trust in the law. And that is what has to be corrected. Thanks, Frank. Uh, this is uh, unbelievable, very compelling, unbelievable. And I'll make one last comment on what you said, and you said it many times before, and you're the man who would know. Corruption, police corruption, 
and police misconduct continue to go on to this day because cops know what goes on and are afraid to come out and speak about it in fear of losing their job or their life. Listen, Frank, we'll do this again. This was uh, a great conversation. And uh, don't worry about the sound effects. It sounded great. I love that rooster in the background. Your voice was still good. I had no problem with it. We'll talk again, buddy. Thanks a lot. I, I just, um, you know, when you get me going, Doug, it, there's, you know, I say I don't want to do this anymore, but I just, I get flashbacks to to when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. You know, we we see stuff and it's a matter of who do you want to believe, the cop or the you know, the suspect or uh, the perpetrator, you know, we weren't there. We don't know. We're second guessing. But something that was embedded in my mind when I was preteen, I was a kid with a shoe shine box walking the streets, shining shoes to make a living when it will cost a nickel or a dime for a shine. And I'm coming home one night because I'd be out till dusk to make some money. And I come upon a black woman who I had seen before she was a nanny. And she would not come out during the day. It was an all black Jewish neighborhood on Eastern Parkway. And I tell you, Doug, it's going to bring me to tears every time I think about this. Okay. But I'm coming home one night, and there she is, sitting on the park bench as usual, except that a POS in a police uniform was beating on this helpless black woman, pounding her with his nightstick. I could hear the stick on her bones. And I was a helpless child and could do nothing. But then I became a police officer, and I wasn't helpless anymore. And I was going to speak out against this cancer of disgusting rot that wears a uniform and hides behind a shield and a gun, these racist, coward criminals. I will never forget that day. Wow. Unbelievable, Frank. You're you're a remarkable, unbelievable man. And I'm going to say this. I said this in in several stories, even when I interviewed you years ago for the 11th chapter story that I did. And I'll say this again for anybody who wants to hear it or don't want to hear it because I don't care. Frank Serpico is the quintessential role model for law enforcement officers all over the country now and in the future. He speaks the truth. Um, He's a remarkable man. He cares about civil liberties, people's human rights. And uh, Frank, this is, uh, it's been an amazing one hour conversation. We will do this again, my friend. You have a good evening. You too, Doug. Thanks so much. For our principles. And I thank Tom for this opportunity today uh, to speak, um, to honor whistleblowers the world over, past, present, and future. Time and again, when I talk to people about corruption, invariably the response I get is, it's human nature. And in so doing, we justify its existence and conveniently absolve ourselves from any further responsibility. I do not believe that corruption or ineptitude are natural functions of the human spirit. However, I do believe that a small group of individuals with egos and greed far greater than the title or office they hold 
often take advantage of their position to enrich themselves and exploit the very people they are meant to serve. To put it bluntly, positions of leadership and trust often equate a license to steal or otherwise behave unjustly or immorally. Titles themselves do not necessarily assure us, as they should, of the credibility or the integrity of the holder, whether the title be president, CEO, police chief, bishop, justice of the court, etc. Against all these impressive titles, there is or has been documented evidence of improprieties and then some. Unfortunately, because of the power of the office, those that occupy these positions feel they are immune to scrutiny and prosecution, untouchable, too big to fail, too big to go to jail. Some may find this difficult to accept, not wanting to believe that we are vulnerable in the hands of those we trust. But having been on the receiving end of the abuse of power, I am all too familiar with this bitter truth. In the old days, men like Willie Sutton were called bank robbers. Their pictures hung in a post office for stealing from local banks. Today, individuals who defraud us of mega millions have their pictures hanging in boardrooms. In my case, a number of books have been written, one by the police commissioner himself, attempting to distort the facts and undermine my credibility. In response to a recent New York Times profile on me, almost 40 years later, a retired New York City police sergeant wrote, Frank, you are a rat. You turned on us, and we will never forget it. I turned on them. Not that they turned on the uniform they wear and the city and the country that they're supposed to serve they can save lives. In my opinion, anyone denying adequate whistleblowing protection to our nation's noble and faithful watchdogs on duty 24-7 have ulterior motives and are either corrupt themselves or have something to hide. Uh, he informed me about uh, the pad. Now, the pad, what uh what is a pad? Uh, How do you define it? A uh, pad is um, a systemized um, pickup of monies from gamblers uh, in order to um, uh, give them immunity from arrest. We must create an atmosphere in which the dishonest officer fears the honest one and not the other way around. I hope that this investigation and any future ones will deal with corruption at all levels within the department and not limit themselves to cases involving individual patrolmen.